think he sang mm -hmm. at Buccaneers game. He did. Yeah, remember? At Royal Field. Sure did. <laughs> he performed Ronnie yeah. Cole, man. Buccaneers yeah. game. Yeah. <laughs> and, hmm. I have vague memories of the Buccaneers. Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is the first place award winner of the 2015 New Orleans Press Club's Excellence in Journalism Award for the category of Best TV Sports Show. Good evening, New Orleans, and welcome to Inside New Orleans Sports. Over the next hour, we're going to look back at 50 years of the New Orleans Saints, and we got two great guests that are going to break it down for you. Ro Brown, sports director at WBOK Radio, also part of SportsNola.com, and Kenny Trahan of SportsNola.com, WGSR Radio, WHNO-TV, and, by the way, also handles the uh, Saints uh, Hall of Fame Museum. Uh, we'll talk about the, the uh, last 50 years. And uh, maybe some great memories for you as we go forward. Guys, welcome to the show. As always, thanks so much for being here. And I always like to start off letting folks know a little bit about what you're involved in. Mr. Brown, welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, please let the audience know a little bit about uh, what Roe Brown is involved in. My real job, I work at the University of New Orleans. I work in the athletics department there. In addition to, as you said, I do a little stuff at WBOK, mm -hmm. WGSO with him, yes. sportsnova.com with him. And since he does everything and runs everything <laughs> and owns everything, everything I do is with him. <laughs> 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 you know, I mean, I'm on the Saints Hall of Fame Selection yes. Committee. With him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who has his hands in everything. <laughs> everything. He's everywhere. No doubt about it. <laughs> Kenny, welcome yeah, back. Yeah, he's looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> We've known each other much too long. <laughs> welcome back to the show. And if you would, kind of pick up where Roe left off. Tell us a little bit about what you're involved in. Well, you just mentioned the preponderance of it with the Saints Hall of Fame and being the general manager and chairman of the board since its inception in 1988. Running SportsNola.com, which has truly been a blessing to have some great people involved. We need to get you involved. Also, uh, being involved with running WGSO and uh, doing sports talk there for 15 years and games and, and overseeing uh, the department. I've gone through every renaissance there imaginable, including running the <laughs> station. Thank goodness I don't do that anymore. And beyond that, running uh, Life Resources Ministries, doing television shows elsewhere, and I don't know. I could go on and on, but we don't have the time, so we go. let that suffice. Well, thanks for thanks mm -hmm. for being with us tonight. It mm -hmm. ought to be a really great night looking back on 50 years of the New Orleans Saints. We start in the 1960s, and guys, uh, November 1st, 1966, the uh, franchise was awarded to New Orleans, but it started a lot earlier, didn't it? It started with uh, uh, Hale Boggs and the congressional uh, delegation doing a little arm twisting on, on Pete Rozelle. <laughs> if you would, kind of take, take, take us back to before the, the, the franchise was awarded to New Orleans. You know, I think I was like a lot of people in this regard. It started even earlier for me. Mm -hmm. The Saints did. You know, the, the Saints for me started in 1960, the first pro football game okay. I ever saw. An exhibition game mm -hmm. at Tad Gormley Stadium between the Packers, who were wearing blue and white, it was that long ago, and the Pittsburgh Steelers. <laughs> that was the first professional football exhibition game. Exhibition game? Yeah, exhibition game yeah. at Tag Army Stadium. And mm -hmm. I always, you know, you know, I mean, I was, you know, eight, nine years old. And mm -hmm. I mean, why can't we have a pro football team here? Why can't we have a major league baseball team here, you know? And so that was the first time I saw a professional athletic event. And then the subsequent exhibition games after that, right. you know, the doubleheader in 1963 at Tulane Stadium. Uh, you know, it's just you know, Coats and, and Cardinals in 65, 66, and just all those. To me, that's where the Saints kind of started because right. I knew that they were trying to get a pro football team, and I really wanted us to have one. Right. So, you know, th that's where it really started for me. You know, right. I mean, even, even before November 1st, 1966, with 
Thank God for Hill Boggs and Russell Long and yeah. arm twisting. You know, because no Atlanta got a team before us, yes, and we, we had the, the running thing where we, they'd have exhibition games. They would draw forty, we draw eighty, and they got a team before us. Right. <laughs> so enter Hill Boggs and Russell Long. Right. Um, if you would pick up Russell Bo uh, Russell Boggs and, and uh, I'm sorry, Russell Long and Hale Boggs, but before that, you, your first memories of pro football here in New Orleans. Now, very much like Roe, I went to two exhibition games in the early '60s and. You guys are right. Russell Long probably is the one that really pushed it across the finish line. Mm -hmm. He did the, the lion's share of the work to make this happen. Hale Boggs was significant as well. And, of course, Dave Dixon played the largest role from the standpoint of being the biggest supporter of and proponent of football. Dave had the dream of being able to get a franchise here. He went after the AFL very hard. Mm -hmm. Of course, the All-Star Game fiasco that occurred here that had uh, some real issues because of racism and issues that existed in the Old South and that had to change. And I think that's one of the reasons we were behind Atlanta and Miami right. in the pecking order, frankly. Mm -hmm. But once the politicians got involved, and Pete Rozelle was a young man, mm -hmm. let's not forget that. And I think he was able to be influenced at that particular point in his existence. It would be much, much more difficult for a city like New Orleans, the market size that it is, to get a franchise now as compared to that. But same memories. I went to a couple of those exhibition games. I thought they were fantastic. I always wanted Major League Baseball here. I still think it would be a better fit overall in basketball mm -hmm. because it's a tourism sport right. and it happens during the summer mm -hmm. and it's a more affordable ticket. Mm -hmm. But that's me. Right. You, you know, in, in 1960, I knew exactly where I sat because mm -hmm. I sat where I was told to sit right. at mm -hmm. that game. Yes. Okay, it was in the, at the end of that horseshoe. Mm -hmm. Okay, and at the time, you know, you're not thinking about that. I mean, I knew that, but man, I got to see. Bart Starr right. and Jim Taylor and Paul Horning, you know, and Bobby Lane and these kind of people. And then with the 1965 AFL All-Star Game mm -hmm. you know, situation where the game was moved to Houston because Which of... Which we elaborate on that for yeah. fans that don't know what happened. In 1965, the all AFL, the American Football League's All-Star Game, was going to be held here in New Orleans. New Orleans was trying to get a pro team, NFL, NFL, trying to get something. And so the game was held here in New Orleans. The week before the game, many of the African-American players had trouble getting cabs to pick them up, and they wouldn't, weren't allowed to go into nightclubs, and especially in the French Quarter. So hotels. They, and hotels. Yeah. Yeah. So they decided, we're not playing. And uh, I think Joe Foss was the commissioner of the, mm -hmm. NFL, of the AFL then, mm -hmm. and uh, they moved the game. And there was a, kind of a black eye for New Orleans. Mm -hmm. I mean, it still recovered from it. But uh, Dave Dixon, who, who I loved, who was a good friend of mine, I'm glad you mentioned Dave. As far as I'm concerned, the only reason why Dave Dixon wasn't the New Orleanian of the 20th century is because Louis Armstrong was. <laughs> okay, right. and you know, to me, I mean, that's how I've always felt right. about it. I mean, he was, he was probably the single most important New Orleanian after Louis Armstrong. And, and, and if you would, f for the audience, why? Uh, kind of name the things he was involved with in, uh, that maybe some people don't you know. know. You know, New Orleans needs a professional football team. So he went about and set about doing it. Right. New Orleans needs a dome stadium. That mm -hmm. would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. His idea, mm -hmm. he did it. You know, football in the spring would do well. That's right. The United States Football League. Uh, right. You know, tennis balls shouldn't always be white. World Championship Tennis. Right. <laughs> okay, the hands of me. He was a guy with ideas, okay, which a lot of people say sometimes we in New Orleans don't think forward. Mm -hmm. Dave Dixon was always thinking in a forward manner. Yes. And, you know, that's, it's impossible. You know, I just, I just always hope that the Saints never really totally divorced themselves from the memory of Dave Dixon because there's no Saints without Dave yeah, Dixon. He's kind of the it guy doesn't exist. Of pro football, you know, right? Yeah, it, exactly. It, yeah. it does not exist. He was that important. The uh, antitrust legislation, which we know was part of the, 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 the uh, New Orleans getting a franchise, Kenny, uh, that was really the, the, the big part of this. Uh, the NFL wanted, uh, wanted to make sure that they were involved and didn't get involved in any, any, any uh, they wanted antitrust. Uh, the um, the, the, the city obviously wanted a franchise, and at that time, a very, very strong congressional contingent was able to put that together. Yeah, very much so. And I think we've detailed the people that were the key people to help make that happen. But from the standpoint of what ended up happening here was, and we'll get into the football, but it was an instant love affair. Mm -hmm. Initially, there's a contest to name the team. Once the franchise was awarded, of course, John Meekham Sr. gave his son the money. He's 27 years old. And everybody thought you were getting a young whippersnapper and handsome guy, the whole deal. And mm -hmm. God bless him, he was a nice enough man, but a terrible owner. Mm -hmm. And that said, <laughs> the contest comes along and people got involved on an incredible basis. And all of this is detailed in the Saints Hall of Fame. You can yes. go check it out and enjoy it. But 
to see the passion of the people. And then, of course, they arrive at the name. And once they get the name, then you've got an outcry from religious people in town and people of faith, and I'm one of those, so I get it completely about you're going to play on Sunday and you're going to call this team the Saints? Are you serious? How blasphemous can you be? <laughs> so it took an invitation and then a prayer uh, from Archbishop Philip Hannon, a wonderful man yes. who about two months before he perished was in the Saints Hall of Fame in the Dome. He wanted to see things one last time. What a wonderful guy. And he, of course, devised the prayer and basically <laughs> gave it a blessing and said it's okay yeah. to play football on a Sunday and the name's fine and everything else. But yet to this day, many people felt that was why the team failed and, and had a lack of right. success, that it was divine intervention. Mm -hmm. Kenny mentioned Russell Long and the arm twisting. It, it made me think about when you mentioned him. Uh, President Jimmy Carter mm -hmm. said that all his life he lived for the day, a dream of the day that a Southerner would be running the country. Mm -hmm. He said, then I got elected president. I got to Washington and found out a Southerner had been running the country all along. <laughs> Russell Long. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Do you guys remember any of the other nicknames who were out there during that time? Yeah. That, uh, can you give some of those to the audience, if you would? Sure. You had Jazz Kings. Jazz Kings. You yeah. had Gators. You had, uh, you had Nightlife. You had a lot of different. It's kind of interesting, <laughs> too, because we ended up having a basketball team called the Jazz. Yes. Mm -hmm. We ended up having a football team called the Knight. Yes. So it's pretty interesting when you go back and look at some of the names that were suggested at the time. These names are kicked around even now. Right. We're talking about a baseball team in the Zephyrs that are going to be renamed next year. We just went through the whole Pelicans rename and rebrand a couple of years ago. So it's funny because a lot of the same names were talked about then. Tarpons mm -hmm. was another one that was mentioned at the time. So all indigenous to the culture, which made sense. Uh, but ultimately, the concept of the Saints was really all about the song. It was right. all yeah. about when the Saints go marching in. But Kenny, yeah. I never thought it was going to be anything else. Because I can remember there was like a form in the newspaper mm -hmm. about buying tickets. Mm -hmm. Okay, this was before you had a team. Right. And they called the team the Saints. Well, that was okay. Dave Dixon. Exactly. Dave, you know, Dave Dixon so, so had, a, Dave Dixon had a ticket else. form to sell mm -hmm. to one of his exhibition games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and the whole pitch to it was you need to buy tickets so that ultimately we can land an AFL franchise, uh -huh. the New Orleans Saints. Wow. Yep. <laughs> yeah, I can he envision that, that I can years yeah. before it happened. So, okay. again, you talk about a visionary. A special man. Tulane misses him, too. He loves right. Tulane very much. Yeah. Well, yeah. speaking of Tulane, talk about Tulane Stadium. Uh, obviously, at that point, I think the largest steel stadium uh, in, 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 the, in, in the world. Largest steel structured stadium and, in the world. And, and talk about that venue for, for, for games and, you know, uh, some of the, some of the uh, your early memories of Tulane Stadium. And truly, Tulane Stadium uh, hosting the Saints as well. Yeah. You know, uh, my first game there was a Tulane game. Mm -hmm. It was 1960 also. Okay. Uh, it was Ole Miss and Tulane. Ole Miss was number one in the mm -hmm. nation that week. Uh, Tommy Mason was at Tulane, mm -hmm. Terry Terrible, Phil Nugent, all those guys. Uh, Jake Gibbs was at Ole Miss. And that's the first time I went into this huge stadium, you know, that my father used to tell me about and that I saw from outside, but it was the first time I went in. Mm -hmm. uh, subsequently, I went a number of years, but there was just something special about that hot, hot September 17th, mm -hmm. 1967 mm -hmm. day of that first game. Yes. Okay. It, you know, it's still the loudest crowd I've ever heard. Still, even person. more loud to than, me, than the it, it's, coming? Yeah, because my, my ears rang. You know, yeah. I mean, it didn't, but it, it really was. It was the loudest crowd I think I've ever heard, even under the roof of the dome. I mean, that was really loud right. when John Gilliam returned that kickoff 94 yards. Which, which it was magical, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. It's the kind of thing where, you know, my whole family was there, you know, my mom, my sister, my brother, everybody, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, one dollar, if you were under 16 to sit in the end zone. I was going to ask you, do you remember, the, do you remember how the cost one of the dollar. ticket? One dollar, yeah. if you were under 16 to yes. sit in the end zone. And, you know, you know to see the Rams, mm -hmm. you know, and just, you know, it, it's what I dreamed about seven years earlier. Yeah. You know, where we actually have a professional sports franchise here. Right. Kenny, why don't you talk about Tulane Stadium and then your yeah. first memories of a Tulane Stadium and, and then with the Saints, when the Saints obviously made that their home. I was a Cub Scout and a Boy Scout, and I went to games mm -hmm. then, and my recollection would be Georgia Tech, Notre Dame in particular. Those games stood out. We, we rode a bus from school as a scout to the game, and we learned for the first time, hooray for the bus driver, bus driver, the bus driver, <laughs> hooray for the bus driver. So it was all good. We get to the stadium. It was gigantic, obviously, uh, and really was mesmerized by the entire experience. Ultimately, of course, the Saints are born, the September 17th game. I'm there 
in the south end zone. I'm 11 years old, sitting with my father. And the thing that sticks out to me the most, the Gilliam run went the other way, so mm -hmm. they went the other direction. And just thought it was going to be easy at that point, first yeah. play, and you score a touchdown. But that said, the guy sitting in front of me, three seats down, I remember it specifically, the whole time. And he was some loudmouth white guy. The whole game, from the very start of the game, from the first series, he kept screaming, we want Colazzo. We want Colazzo. <laughs> so I finally nudged my dad. I said, Dad, what's Colazzo? He says, Oh, he means Quazzo, backup quarterback. <laughs> Everybody wants the backup quarterback. Right. Remarkable. But my sister was an original dancer for the Saints Mademoiselles in 67. She ultimately danced for the Saints Bonhomies and the Saints Angels. Mm -hmm. My wife danced for the Saints Sations. My sister introduced me to my wife. Uh, I ended up working Saints games, of course, covering them. I sold Brown's Velvet Ice Cream when I was a right. teenager at Tulane Stadium. Black Started covering the Saints when I was 20 yes. and ended up doing their broadcast and ended up running the Saints Hall of Fame. Dad's an original season ticket holder. We still have those tickets, so you get the picture. Yeah. Very deep ties. My sister performed at the first halftime show. It, really? As a member of the Xavier University Choir. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Singing Up, Up, and Away. Yeah. Well, the, the halftime shows right. with were Al the Hurt. best thing right. about the games. Right. Yeah. Wayne, about the halftime shows? Yeah, yeah. Wayne really Walker was. produced the halftime Tommy, shows. Tommy Walker. Well, Tommy Walker. Uh -huh. they, did the, they did the, well, he mentioned Up, Up, and Away. Didn't <laughs> Fifth Dimension performed at yeah. halftime. <laughs> Carol Channing performed. I mean, they brought in all kinds of people. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, of course, the, 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 what they staged. And that was a big part of it. I mean, they had guys skyrocketing into the stadiums, yes. hot air balloons. Battle in New Orleans. But then the Battle in New Orleans. <laughs> but the problem about that was my sister was standing Ooh. about 10 feet away when the cannon went off. And unfortunately, she saw the whole thing, and the guy yes. lost his hand. Oh, and she's standing man. 10 feet away and saw the whole thing. Was that the end of the cannon, guys? Was well, that was, the, that was the end of Tommy Walker's halftime shows, right. by and large. Mm -hmm. After yeah. that, right. uh, they got a mandate. you got to scale this down. You right. can't have this anymore. And, I'll, and, of course, the NFL halftime shows, Pretty much a choreograph now, and it's a shame. Yeah. Yeah. There's only 12 minutes at halftime. Right? Uh, you know, my you know second year at Saints Press Guide. You got it there in the mm -hmm. in the uh, yeah, museum. We have them all, yeah. My sister, you can see her standing behind Al Hurt. You know, play, that's the cover of the halftime mm -hmm. cover of the Press Guide the next year. So yeah, it, it's all kinds of really really great right. memories of the, that first year of Saints. Al Hurt, Pete Fountain. I mean, I can mm -hmm. remember so yeah. many New Orleans musicians that were there at halftime. I mean, Al Hurt leading the team out. Can you guys talk about he, those yeah. memories? Yeah, but he, he, here's another New Orleans, totally New Orleans thing. I can remember that first game, Ram Saints, never happened now. People passing food around that they brought into, into the stadium. The stadium. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Sandwiches mm -hmm. and, and ribs and, you know, people that you didn't know, you know, right. would you like to, people passing food around. Yeah. <laughs> right. No, the, you, you mentioned the musicians. Of course, Al Hurd was, was a de facto employee of the team. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people don't recognize this or realize this to this day and in, in age, but you know who the Saints' initial press box announcer was, don't you? Buddy. Buddy Deliberto. Really? Yeah. So, it was Buddy. Yeah, Buddy was the Saints' biggest Buddy. booster mm -hmm. uh, for the first three or four mm -hmm. years of the franchise. He was a fan. And it turned one day, and, mm -hmm. and it never went back. And his relationship with John Meekham was terribly unfortunate. And unfortunately, it never really healed up, and the owner had a lot to do with that. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, early Saints teams... Talk about those teams. Talk about some of the players that you remember on those teams. You know, I, I remember characters and players that were kind of on their last hurrah. Those guys that were just, you know, they uh -huh. came, they, they, were, um, they, they were drafted uh, by, by the Saints. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of those guys that were, were part of that draft were uh, guys that just, you know, were at the end of their careers. Mm -hmm. in, 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 when, when you start talking about the expansion draft. Yeah, expansion draft. I remember going to a, a, a uh, tryout. Mm -hmm. It was at Tulane's baseball stadium. It wasn't even in the stadium. It was at Tulane's baseball stadium. It was just guys who, you know, guys who wanted a shot at playing mm -hmm. pro football. I'm sure, that, you know, I don't think any of those guys made the team uh, or anything like that. But, yeah, the first year, the expansion draft, you had people that you knew from other teams, names that you knew, and then you had some more draft choices because during that day, during those days, you were able to draft about 80 people. Right. <laughs> Especially if you were an expansion team, you got an extra draft, almost an extra pick in every round. Uh, you mentioned Gary Quazzo, who uh, was I guess, supposed to be their quarterback. It was supposed yes. to be their quarterback, but but when you think about it, Kenny. I mean, that really told the story of the early years because they gave up so much to get him. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course. <laughs> you know, to get this veteran quarterback. Right. You know, 
John Meekham wanted to win now. He thought that getting Horning and Taylor would do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you gave up even more. Did and Paul Horning ever play for the Saints? No. Nope. He didn't. Nope. nope. He was on but the But Jim sideline. Taylor did, right? Jim yes. Taylor played his first yeah. year, and he right. played admirably. Mm -hmm. They had a terrible offensive line, mm -hmm. and he got shellacked. Mm -hmm. But he played hard and played well, and he got beat up so much he retired after that first yes. year. So actually worked the Saints broadcast for a few years and worked mm -hmm. for the team in an executive capacity for uh, a little bit. But expansion draft successes. Doug Atkins and Davey Witzel. Mm -hmm. Well, Dave Witzel became the first Pro Bowl player of the Saints. Very All cool. pro, in fact. Ten interceptions mm -hmm. his first Led year. Mm -hmm. Played wonderfully. And Doug Atkins was really good here. Yeah. I mean, people don't understand. He only played here three years. He's in the Saints Hall of Fame. Now, it's a place and time. Keep in mind mm -hmm. right. that when he was inducted, it was all about the early years of the Hall of Fame. But those three years, he was still really good. He was I mean, in his he late 30s. Yeah. 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 Guy just threw people around like rag dolls. Mm -hmm. He was an exception to the rule at that point in time with his size. Not just big in terms of height, but... But he was 285 and he was quick. Long so arms and big arms. Long arms and, and big hands. Oh, yeah. And a scary guy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, back then, uh, when you looked at the draft, like you mentioned, uh, 17, 18 rounds, something like that. Mm -hmm. 17. 17. Was it 17? And, and in the 17th round, they, they took a wide receiver out of uh, Xavier, Ohio. Yeah. Danny, Danny Abramowitz. Huh? Talk about that. I can remember he made the team solely because of special teams in the exhibition mm -hmm. games. You know, he, he, he made every tackle it seemed, in the mm -hmm. exhibition games. And that's probably probably what kept him on the team, I would think. And lo and behold, he becomes this very slow, very good wide receiver. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was really, really slow, but caught everything, you know, and was tough. Uh, favorite people on there, my, I remember my sister's favorite player was Obert Logan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Little O. <laughs> Zero? Zero. Little o. Right. was his number. Right. You know, Obert Logan. You know, right. you had people on that team who, you know, had probably had no more business playing the National Football League than, you know, like you do on a lot of expansion mm -hmm. teams, especially right. during that time. But, you know, it was fun. They were ours. Yes. <laughs> they belonged to us. You know, whatever they were, uh, yeah. they belonged to us. Right. They the were city guys. supported them, right? The city um, supported them. Uh, Danny, Danny Abramowitz tells a story that he was actually cut. Yes. And he talked his way uh -huh. back into in. staying on the mm -hmm. team at that particular point in time. Good thing. The characters, yeah, they were everywhere. Of course, everybody knows about Atkins and his shenanigans and charades off the field and even on flights. But aside from him, the guy that stood out in my mind, and I still, in running the Hall of Fame, I still deal with a lot of these guys who are still alive, which is great. Uh, Bill Cody, mm -hmm. wild Bill Cody. Mm -hmm. He was and he was wild. Robert. I mean, he threw himself all over the place mm -hmm. and basically made the team because of his eccentricity on special mm -hmm. teams, the way he just was crazed out there, which you had to be, mm -hmm. and was really good. Eli Strand's another guy that was yeah, a was very cool. emotional guy who was lo just loved the fact that somebody gave him a chance to play in the mm -hmm. NFL, and he expressed it all the time. Steve but there Stonebreaker. were some good players. <laughs> yeah, Stonebreaker was a character, and you know, that's how, the touchdown, the, fight in that's New how York? the touchdown club mm -hmm. ended up getting formed. Stonebreaker yeah. gets in a fight in New York. He gets fined, and Joe Gemelli wants to raise the money to pay the fine, and the league won't do it. Right. So they form the touchdown club instead, and they funnel the money to him anyway. So, mm -hmm. And that's how the touchdown club ended up getting formed. So those were special times, and there were some good players. Yeah. They had a really good young defensive line a core there with Dave Rowe and Dave Mike Tillman in Mike particular. Mm -hmm. Big Brian Timber. Schwader was a solid player. Mm -hmm. And so they had some pretty good players, but not enough of them. Mm -hmm. And they did such a poor job drafting that there was no way they could overcome the age, which Rowe spoke of, that they started the franchise with, and the lack of hitting on draft picks for several years. Or when they did hit on somebody, they didn't keep them. Like John Gilliam, like yes. Ken Burrow, right. to name a few. Mm -hmm. So listen, uh, again, the evaluation was awful. I still maintain Tom Fears was a good coach and a good man, but unfortunately, I, yeah, he, was. Was saddled, he, was, right, yeah. he was saddled with a horrendous mm -hmm. general manager, horrible owner, terrible decisions, and he had to go make something out of it, which, of course, he couldn't. Vic Schwenk? Yeah, Vic Schwenk. Vic Schwenk. Right. Dick Gordon. Dick Gordon, Dick the, Gordon astronaut, the astronaut. The astronaut. <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah but it got, we, as, as the history progressed, it got even, it was, it was even, it got even more, more comical. Right, more you would think that by the time you get of age, you'd figure it out right. if you're John mm -hmm. Meekham, but instead... You know, you fast forward to 1979, they have one of the two best offenses in the mm -hmm. NFL, mm -hmm. along with San Diego, and they go 8-8, eight and eight, and they're one of the most exciting teams you could ever imagine. So instead of leaving it alone, they go out and hire Harold Guyver and Dick, and, uh, Dick Rosenblum, son yes. Steve Rosenblum, to come in here, and Dick Nolan, who is a really good man, says, yeah. what are they doing? Mm -hmm. They came in, they wrecked everything, wouldn't pay guys, 
Galbraith held out. Muncie had serious off-the-field issues. Don Reese was a problem. The team fell apart. They went 1-15. And, and that was, to me, uh, that was the beginning of the end for John Meekham. Mm -hmm. And the end came, of course, on Black Sunday yes. when Bum Phillips elects not to try a 49-yard field goal and decides to punt with Guido Merkins mm -hmm. instead of trying a field goal uh, with Morton Anderson. And they punt the ball, and the Rams haven't done anything the whole game. And yeah. they get a drive. They go and kick the field goal. And Mike Lansford. Mike Lansford. And yeah. that's it. <laughs> and that was it. For, that was the end of John Meekham's era. Yeah. That was, he quit after that. And by the way, Bum Phillips pretty much quit after that, yeah. too. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, let, let's, let's go back a bit, because let's start at the 70s. And mm -hmm. in the 70s, you've got to think of, I guess, the first one, Archie Manning. The drafting of Archie Manning out of Ole Miss. 1971. Third pick in the draft. Third pick. Third poor pick. guy. Right. Yeah, poor guy. <laughs> <laughs> there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, third pick in the draft. Uh, you know, I was, I went in the Navy in 1971, mm -hmm. okay, you know, but was, was here for the draft. I'll always remember also, you know, my father, when you're talking about their picks, mm -hmm. and Tommy Casanova came out, the year he came out of LSU. And I can remember Wayne Mack or someone interviewed, you know, general manager or whatever, and said, what did you think about Tommy Casanova? And he said, well, we had him rated as the fifth best defensive back in the draft. Close. And I remember my dad looked at me and said, there's no hope for these people. <laughs> 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 that boy is the fifth best defensive back in the draft. He said, I don't think so. Okay. And <laughs> Archie comes along, you know, it's a no-brainer. You know, everybody's glad they got Archie. Archie's a saint, mm -hmm. remember? That was, yes, the, that was the bumper sticker, mm -hmm. you know. And, and, yeah, terrific, terrific college quarterback. They figured the proximity. He was from Mississippi, mm -hmm. played at Ole Miss. Uh, they, you know, always thinking that they had to have the regional thing. But we were still at a point where this was treated like a college team, mm -hmm. okay? You know, I mean, people were going to, you know. I don't think it really, people started to kind of look at him kind of under-eyed and tell, you know, maybe around Hank Stram time. Mm -hmm. You know, I think before that, right. just play hard and we're behind you. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I think that was the, the general feeling. Yes. But, you know, when you talk about picks, I want to go back also to Les Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> the very it. first right. pick at the University of right. Alabama, very first number mm -hmm. one pick. Right. You know, I mean, that was one where even, you know, at my age, I knew, why did they draft him? Yeah. Yeah. Was he a <laughs> linebacker and they, and they moved in a fullback or fullback and they moved to linebacker? Mm -hmm. At Alabama in the Sugar Bowl against Nebraska, he was a fullback. Mm -hmm. Okay. He played behind Kenny Stabler, you know, and, it, and he was just a straight ahead fullback. The Saints drafted him and they made him a linebacker. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's always a challenge when you draft someone and then you move them to another yeah. position. Yeah, they said he was a linebacker. Yes. Yeah. Which he wasn't. Right. He probably wasn't a fullback either. No. <laughs> Kenny, before there was Archie Manning, there was a 63 yard field goal that happened at Tulane Stadium with Tom Dempsey. Was it November 8, 1970? Correct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, November 8, mm -hmm. 1970. And ironically, the week after Tom Fears got fired, and J.D. Roberts mm -hmm. came in from the Richmond Roadrunners. And, and when you saw what happened in the first game, you thought, boy, what a genius move these guys must have made. But then yeah. you hear the stories afterwards. Archie tells some really funny stories. Yeah. And he does. God bless J.D. Roberts. But J.D. didn't even know the players' names. I mean, I could go on and on. It was just comically bad. Mm -hmm. That said, that was a memory of a lifetime. And Tom, a wonderful man, mm -hmm. and our prayers are with him today. Uh, Tom uh, can't be, you know, out in public or do anything. He's been pretty much institutionalized, you know, mm -hmm. from the, yeah. the things that he's had in his life. And he's a phenomenal human being. And Carlene's a wonderful lady and we became great friends. And what Tom did that day is, of course, legendary. And you know, the test of time mm -hmm. tells you everything you need to know. The record stood for over four decades. Yes. It's remarkable. And it took altitude to beat it. So Tom was a, is a great guy. I want to say was. He's a great person. Decided to make his home here despite the fact that they kicked him to the curb. And that was another story in itself after yeah. the field goal. And after that season, the next year, uh, Roberts wants him to, to run gassers and he wants him to do drills with the regular players. And Tom says, I'm a kicker. I'm not doing that stuff. And the end result was a dispute and they ended up cutting him. Mm -hmm. The only problem with that was they'd already published the media guide for that season. <coughs> and who's on the media guide? Tom, Tom Dempsey. Dempsey. <laughs> they cut him. So Unreal. nothing can really speak to the right. Saints' futility and ignorance at that time yes. more than that. Yeah. So, yep, Tom was banished and... It was a shame. All he did was go on and kick 11 years in a league with great success. Sean Payton tells a story that as a kid, you know, Tom came over to him and handed him a ball. 
when he was 11 years old. He said he never forgot that. So when he first got to town, Peyton comes to me at the Hall of Fame. We had a private uh, lunch for the coaches, and he says, I want to meet Tom Dempsey. Do you have contact with him of all your alumni? I said, yes, mm -hmm. I do. So I arranged a meeting. They became fast friends. And when Tom ran into his difficulty, Sean insisted on going to visit him. I said, well, he's not going to know who you are. But he insisted on doing so anyway. So, mm -hmm. you know, one thing about Peyton, you know, you can say anything about him personally or professionally, but he has an incredible sense of the history of the game. Mm -hmm. And he deeply, deeply appreciates the guys that played the game 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And the way he treats the former players is remarkably good. And I, and I don't, if the statute of limitations is run out, so I can say this now. You guys would recall this. I know you would, and you probably would too, Eric. There was a period of time when Tom Benson had bought the team. <laughs> After a certain period of years, the media guy no longer included anything oh, yes. prior to 1985 yes, that's right. mm -hmm. and the Tom Benson era. Mm -hmm. When Sean first got here, and we had this private meeting at the museum with his coaches, and they were amazed. They couldn't believe, man, we got a Hall of Fame for this franchise? Are you kidding me? <laughs> so, and that's really the way they expressed it. Yeah. But Sean says, I want to know what the issues are, because I've heard we don't have a great relationship with our alumni. I said, that would be the understatement of the century. He says, well, what's the problem? I said, well, where do you want to start? You know, they haven't reached out to them. They've done little or nothing for them. The Hall of Fame is really the only ones that do anything for them. And I don't, I don't care what people think. That was the truth at the time. Right. Saints have since stepped up and done better things, and that's great. But I told Peyton, I said, let me, give you, let me show you why these guys have a great distaste mm -hmm. for the Saints. Mm -hmm. I went and grabbed a media guy, and I showed it to him. I said, what's wrong with this picture? He looks at it, he says, 67 to 85. What are they missing, 20 years? Yeah. Yeah. I said, yeah, he says, well, why is that? I said, it's by design. Mm -hmm. Took it out. He says, that's crazy. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fix that. By the next season, all the previous years were yeah. back in the media, guys. Yeah. So that's, you know, if you can say anything you want about Peyton, that's one thing you say about him that you have to appreciate. Yeah. That, 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 was, that was ridiculous. I had to keep it's an old media guy <laughs> just, just, to, just to keep up with what yeah. went before 1985. You're watching Inside New Orleans Sports each and every Thursday night right here on WLAE TV. There's a re that it's at six o'clock. There's a rebroadcast every Friday at ten o'clock on WLAE TV and on Pelican Sports Television, New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette, nine p.m. every Friday night. We're looking back on 50 years of the New Orleans Saints. Kenny Trahan of SportsNewell.com, also the Saints Hall of Fame Museum, and so much more, along with Roe Brown of WBOK Radio. And I'm your host, Eric Ash. We'll be right back. Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is underwritten by... Located on Lake Pontchartrain, Brisbee's Lakefront Restaurant and Bar offers traditional West End favorites, a scenic view, oysters, and numerous tasty options. More information is available at 504-304-4125 or brisbeesrestaurant.com. Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House has been shocking here since 1979. Located at 3117 21st Street in Metairie, Mr. Ed's Oyster Bar and Fish House offers raw, fried, and grilled oysters as well as a range of Cajun and Creole dishes. Enjoy a dozen with a smile. You're watching WLAE, New Orleans Public Television. Find us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Welcome back to Inside New Orleans Sports. We're taking a look back at 50 years of New Orleans Saints history. Kenny Trahan and Roe Brown are our guests tonight. Roe, Hank Strand becomes the, the, the Saints coach, and a lot of people like myself during that time thought we were going to turn it around. Ooh. He puts a prolific offense together. Mm -hmm. uh, was it Chan Wes Chandler, a number one draft choice out of Florida, Henry Childs, mm -hmm. Ike Harris mm -hmm. comes over, and then you had Thunder and Lightning, Muncie and Galbraith. Talk about your memories of Stram and your memories of that prolific offense. And Archie Manning. And Archie Manning. Trigger, yes. Of course, uh, NFC Offensive Player of the Year, mm -hmm. I think, Archie Manning was, because of what he had around him. Muncie and Galbraith. Thunder and lightning, terrific, terrific backfield. Uh, you know, for the first time, I felt like, you know, if you were a Saint fan, you had real professional, you know, top flight football players on offense. Uh, Wes Chandler, you know, mm -hmm. one of the best athletes and one of the best, you know, receivers and return guys you'd ever want. Ike Harris, very professional, 
very low key, ran his routes, you know, made the tough catches, the whole works. Uh, Offensive line wasn't bad because they had, what was the crazy guy's name? Conrad uh, Dober. Yeah, what was mm -hmm. his name? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who I ran into, as a matter of fact, at Super Bowl 44. Mm -hmm. was as crazy yes. as ever. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. But, yeah, you know, JT Taylor. JT uh, good. Z-Man, Emmanuel Sanders. Emmanuel yeah, Z-Man was a good football player, you know, out of Jackson State. That offense was just mm -hmm. so much fun. Not very good on defense. Defense, right. But, boy, that offense was fun. Yeah. I mean, they scored on anybody and everybody. Yes, they did. Guys, let's kind of move into the 80s. It starts, uh, obviously, um, uh, with the 1-15 season, mm -hmm. which, uh, as you mentioned, was kind of the uh, downturn for, for Meekum. But it brought in Bum Phillips, and then that 81 draft, if you remember yeah. that 81 draft, which was <laughs> one of the best drafts in the history of the franchise. Well, 82. Was, the was it 80, 82, 82, 82? 82. 82 and 87 right. drafts were incredible. Mm -hmm. But just on the backtrack very briefly on that 70s bunch, and even carrying over to the 80s initially, while the defense wasn't very good, there were good players. Tommy. And the Saints had two safeties that might have been the hardest hitting safety team in the NFL. Tommy Myers, Tommy Myers and Ray Brown. <laughs> yeah. they, they just punished people like you wouldn't believe. And Myers, to this day, might be my favorite player mm -hmm. they've ever had because the guy weighed 190 pounds. And yes. yet the, he blew people up. He gave his body to science. In fact, I communicated oh, with him man. today. He left body parts all over the field on every field in the league. Mm -hmm. He was something to watch. He's, and Ray Brown yeah. got, came here from, from Atlanta. Atlanta, and mm -hmm. he just he waylaid people. Those guys, they struck the fear of God into you. You didn't run routes inside the hash marks against the Saints. Those guys killed people. I mean, they killed people. And, and I'm not trying to overstate it, but they were such vicious oh, hitters. Mm -hmm. Joe Fetterspiel was a vicious hitter. Mm -hmm. He hit people like a ton of bricks. Derlin Moore was a good football player, but he's an unbelievable effort mm -hmm. guy. You know, that gave you everything he had all the time. So there were some good Don players. Don Reese had his problems. Don Reese was extremely was talented. But Don Reese would he, Well, he right. could have had an he incredible really career. Well. But, yes. you know, unfortunately, Reese arrived here at a bad time because the culture, the drug culture, really started mm -hmm. to infiltrate mm -hmm. the franchise. And it was the undoing right. of this franchise, frankly. Right. Chuck Muncy was Exhibit A, and it's really unfortunate because Chuck Muncy was really a nice mm -hmm. guy. Unfortunately, he had some major issues. But so you get into the 80s. And 1 in 15 happened because of what I mentioned previously, because of the drug culture, mm -hmm. because of the intervention of John Meekham bringing in Rosenblum and Guyver for what reason, who, who, ha, who knows? Mm -hmm. You just had your best year, you're yeah. exciting as can be, and you're going to mess with everything. So Galbraith holds out, Muncy's got a serious problem, you know, he's late for practice, missed a flight, everything imaginable. Reese yeah. is, a, is a real problem with the guys in the locker room, and a lot of people at the time tried to paint it out as is racial, the white guys and the black guys, that had nothing to do with that. And Archie would tell you that. It had everything to do with the fact that you had a drug culture that had really controlled a certain element of the team, yep. and guys were getting away with it. And they didn't act when they should have acted initially and cut it off. They let it proliferate itself, and then finally Muncie missed a flight for a game, and they decided to trade him. Mm -hmm. and, but having said that, they were already done for that year. And then they bring in Bum, you know, and let's draft George Rogers, and we're going to run the ball. And it was actually a pretty smart move on their part, and they became a different team and a physical team. And then the draft you spoke about in '82, when they brought in some great football mm -hmm. players. You know, uh, George was, uh, you know, was obviously great. Ricky was a great player. Yes, Ricky. That's '81. You're right. 81. It was Ricky yeah. and George, and they were, they were, you know, obviously you can stop right there. But they weren't the only guys mm -hmm. that they got in that draft. They ended up doing a really good job Jim of Wilkes. identifying players. Right. Jimmy Wilkes was the twelfth round. Hokey, Hokey. Right. Hokey was the tenth round <laughs> right. guy. They got. Right. They had guys yeah. that uh, they they brought in here that that just uh, were really good core of guys. They became a very physical team, mm -hmm. but ultimately Bum's quarterback decisions and skill position decisions did him in. Mm -hmm. He thought Wes Chandler wasn't fast enough. Yes. That's what he told us. Mm -hmm. So he trades him and he drafts Lindsey Scott like he's mm -hmm. fast enough. Right. And of course, you know, then he takes a situation at quarterback and and ditches Archie, who's the most popular player in franchise history, to bring in a guy who, who can't even walk anymore and Kenny Stable. God bless him. Yes. You know, he was still accurate from 5 to 10 yards, mm -hmm. but he couldn't move and he couldn't throw the ball 20 yards. Right. Yeah. And he decided he could play people like I mean, Jeff Groth. God bless Jeff Groth. Mm -hmm. He's a, you he, he know, Merkins became a yes. wide receiver for this team. So, right. you know, you're not going to win that way. you got to have some weapons on offense, and they just never got there. And then I mentioned 83 Black Sunday. As good as they were defensively, uh, you know, they – they couldn't get over the hump because of the decisions that they right. made and obviously because of the lack of offense that they had. By 1985, Bur uh, Bum was burned out. Wade Phillips takes over for a short stint in the middle of the season, and then along comes a guy named Jim Finks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, still to this day, what I think of all the people I've met in pro football, he, he was a guy who knew everybody's job. He knew your job. <laughs> 
<laughs> he knew everything. He is the first person I met who knew everything and knew how to handle everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he handled it not the way you would have, and sometimes he was bullheaded. But, you know, Jim Finks, he was brilliant just to mm -hmm. talk to him. I mean, it was just brilliant. Mm -hmm. I've seen him walk into the times where he'd make some decision and the fan base would be mad at him and he'd show up at the touchdown club mm -hmm. or whatever and, and everybody would just mm -hmm. be mad at him. Never missed and, a quarterback club. And he'd you. walk out an hour later and had everybody eating mm -hmm. out of his hand. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'd tell him, you did it again, didn't you? And he'd just look at me with that cigarette and smile. Mm -hmm. again, he was very, very important to hire right. because he – there comes Jim Mora. Right. Mm -hmm. Jim Mora after that. But it was Tom Benson that made that move when he bought this franchise and saved this franchise from going to Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. I can remember it clear as mm -hmm. day as Meekum getting off the plane at the old Gator, um, off the helicopter, the old Gator Stadium. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk that the, that the Saints were moving on. They were going to be moving to Jacksonville. With Bum. Right. With, with, with Bum, no <laughs> doubt. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then uh, you know, Governor Edwards gets involved. And I know there was a the, uh, the, was it the, uh, uh, Prinksters, um, Pritzker, Pritzker. 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 Out, of, yeah. out of Chicago was mm -hmm. supposed to buy it. Right. Lo and behold, some unknown car dealer out of New Orleans comes in with Texas ties and buys this <laughs> team and does a smart move. Tom Benson turns to Jim Finks, who at that time had just left the Chicago Cubs, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and makes him Nolten, part owner mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. president and general manager. Okay. Yeah, well, Jim Finks was universally respected and should yeah. have been the commissioner of the league. Yep. Ultimately, but thought he was gonna that be. was a brilliant move on the part of of Tom Benson. Give Tom Benson all the credit in the world. He really did save the franchise yeah. initially, and there's no question that he's a pivotal figure in the history of the franchise and a very rich man because of it. Mm -hmm. Bought it for $69 million and Lord knows what you can get for it now. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, he made a very, very intelligent move to bring in Jim Finks, and Finks made a very intelligent move to hire mm -hmm. Jim Mora, who basically dominated the mm -hmm. United States Football League. And the reason it was such a good hire was not only was Mora a good coach and a disciplinarian with his Marine background, and the thing you can always say about his teams more than anything else is they beat the teams that they were supposed to beat. Right. They lost to the teams that, they, that were better than them on a consistent basis, but they were, unfortunately came along at the wrong time. Because the Saints, to this day, if they were in the AFC, I guarantee you, they not only would have won playoff games, they could have gotten to a Super Bowl. But unfortunately, during that era, you had the dynastic franchises, mm -hmm. including in their own division, the 49ers. Four. And then you had the Joe Gibbs Redskins, and you had the Bill Parcells Giants. And on the back end, you had the Jimmy Johnson Cowboys. So all in the NFC, and the right. Saints were part of that. So it was bad fortune. But Mora was an underrated, really good football coach who deserves an enormous amount of credit. I think Finks and Mora and, frankly, the other three members of the Dome Patrol should be the guys that should be on that ring of honor mm -hmm. in the Dome, mm -hmm. not just in the Saints Hall of Fame because yes. of what they accomplished. So, yep, they brought stability. They brought winning, obviously. And they brought excitement. That 87 season, to me, is still the most yeah. special season ever yeah. because you never won before. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Mora could have been elected mayor, governor, anything yes. he wanted. And the, the fire, and my wife was at the Sensations. That was their first year. My wife danced for the team, and so I got, I was all over the place with them. And, and the excitement, it was incredible. Yeah. I mean, that's all people could talk about seven days a week, 24 hours a day. It was special. I mean, it was like a light lit up in the yes. city. And... You know, it hasn't been extinguished since, quite frankly. For a five-year period, the Saints were the winningest team in the yeah. NFC. And they couldn't get over the hump or, or because the of NFL. who they were in there. Mm -hmm. And the reason, they were the second winningest mm -hmm. team. And the reason, the problem was, the winningest team was in their division. Yes. <laughs> San Francisco 49ers. Yeah. Well, right. they were, I mean, they were an incredible yeah. franchise. Yeah. But, right. And you go back and look at and people want to ridicule Mora for not winning a playoff game. And look, everybody's right. entitled to their opinion. That's fine. But go back and look at the games. There was only one of those they blew, the Eagles game. Mm -hmm. If you go back and look at the playoff appearances, the first year was the not ready for primetime players mm -hmm. against Vikings. the Vikings. Okay, they just got shellacked because the team was better than they were. Yes. The second time they got in, they're playing with Steve Walsh and John Forcade mm -hmm. at quarterback because of Jim Fink's stubbornness with Bobby Abier. Yes. And they really hurt that team at a time when they were in their prime. Mm -hmm. And so they don't win in Chicago. You know, then the Falcons game, the next year the Saints, as you might recall, go 7-0 and and Abier gets hurt. Mm -hmm. Right. And they stumbled toward the finish line. They won out in Arizona, cover the game to go to, to win the division and go to the playoffs. But they play the Falcons, and they're playing the Falcons with three of their four secondary starters out for the game. Michael and Haynes goes Michael wild. Haynes yeah. goes nuts, and they mm -hmm. missed a tackle. See you mm -hmm. later. But the point was that those three games, because of the circumstances, they weren't going to win those games, unfortunately. Right. Right. The Eagles game was a different story. Had total control of the game, dominating the game. Then they have a play where... Cunningham just throws one he never should throw deep down mm -hmm. the center of the field in the double coverage. Two guys are there. 
Neither one can make a play. Touchdown. The game turns on that. And that was the end of the Saints in that, that era. It really was. Yes. Jim Morris stayed through the middle of 96. Mm -hmm. But it was over with that day because that's when they decided, you know, we're breaking this up. Yes. Brock was gone after the year. Bear was gone after the year. Within a matter of two years, Eric Martin's gone. Mm -hmm. Vaughn Johnson's gone. Sam Mills is gone. Uh, then Ricky. Morton, of course, in 84. I mean, these were iconic players. Yes. I mean, great football players on a great, you know, great defensive football team that never had the offensive weaponry to be what they needed to be. They were a workmanlike offense. Eric Martin's their best player, and he couldn't run either. He was like a modern-day Danny mm -hmm. Brown, where it's just yeah. a guy yeah. that caught everything, was tough as yes. nails, and would take every hit imaginable. Great player. Dalton Hilliard was a really good football player and then got hurt. Reuben Mays was electric fast, and then he got hurt. So they just didn't have the weaponry, and then they didn't draft well. You know, once the 89-90 season rolled around, they drafted poorly for a few years. Well, the USFL and what is it, the 86 draft? Well, really, the, the, as Kenny but, was, but it was like two drafts. That, right. That's why it was like two the drafts. hire of Mora right. was mm -hmm. such a good yes. hire. Right. It was like because two drafts. not only did he dom exactly, not <laughs> only did he dominate the USFL, he had all the ties that binded to that league, and that's how he was the one that went into Jim Finks and said. This guy, Mel Gray. We Sam have Mills. Him. We got to have Sam Johnson, Mills. I don't care what he looks like. Mel Antonio Gray, Gibson. We got to have this guy. Gibson. Take a look <laughs> at him. You know, even Willie Collier. I mean, you can go back and look at that initial team. Exactly. They had like seven oh, guys yes. that were good football players. Bobby A. All from the USFL. <laughs> That's right. And Jim Mora was the guy that said, yeah. Jim Finks, Jim, here's the guys yeah. we need to get right here. And that's the reason when you added them into the guys that Bum had here previously right. mm -hmm. that they became the team right. they became. And that, what is it, that 86 draft with Mays and, 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 and Dalton? Dalton. Yeah. Dombrowski. You know, Dombrowski. Mm -hmm. Those, those Dombrowski. were the on and on, yeah. Right, no yeah. doubt. As, as, we go, as, we, as we leave the 90s and go into the 2000s, obviously Jim Haslett uh, uh, is the coach of this team. Not a, a real big um, uh, splash with Haslett for the most part. Your but thoughts? first playoff win. Exactly. Got to give him that. First playoff win. Right. You know, that, that, that's... That's all you need to say about Jim Hassan right. to me, I think. You know, first playoff win. Right. Yeah. Well, I think there's something to be said there, too. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody forgets the role that Randy Mueller played mm -hmm. here. Randy Mueller mm -hmm. yes. really did an outstanding job yep. of assembling people. And it's not for me to say what happened with him mm -hmm. and ownership, but unfortunately, that was cut short. Uh, Mickey Loomis was his right-hand mm -hmm. man, and he ended up taking over. But Jim Hazlitt came in at the right time. They made some really smart acquisitions. Joe Horn was a... You know, was a part-time receiver basically in Kansas City. Mm -hmm. And then you looked at Norman Hand. Everybody, mm -hmm, oh, he's right. too heavy. He's not going to be able to play. They brought in a similar guy, Grady Jackson. Uh, then they had Mitchell, who was fast as mm -hmm. heck as linebacker. Mark Fields, who could really run at linebacker. Mm -hmm. And then you look at the other pieces that they were able to fit in. And then they brought in a quarterback and Jeff Blake, Jeff Blake, who was a deep ball guy. Yes. And played honest. He played honest, honestly decent to mm -hmm. solid football. He got yeah. hurt. And then Aaron Brooks comes in, and he does things that they haven't seen before, right, running exactly. around like crazy, throwing a ball like 70 yards on a line. Like, wow. So when you saw that happen, you're like, man, we got something here that's going to be fantastic. But then they ended up making a series of moves over several years that proved to be fatal. Sammy Knight was too slow. He wasn't good enough, right? <laughs> so you, so you, you signed to Bucky Jones yes, for a boatload of money. Leroy Glover's too small. <laughs> right. Yeah, he's too small. 17 okay. sacks from I mean, inside. Right. Unbelievable. Right. I mean, They're still looking for that guy. <laughs> Albert Connell, right. okay? Where do you want me to stop? They made a series of moves that undermined uh, the potential success of this team that, that kept them a 500-type team for the rest of the regime until Katrina hit, which right. obviously you can't blame Jim Haslam. No, Exhibition can't. game where they had the natural turf indoors. Saints played the Packers. Packers, mm -hmm. yeah. I can remember I the after the turf game, in the museum. after the game, mm -hmm. after everybody was gone, sitting in there, talking to Brett while he was eating his Subway sandwich, everybody else was gone. He said, you know, y'all got a guy here, you know, the backup that we had, Aaron Brooks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He could do something. Right. <laughs> I didn't think uh, anything. Until the injury, really though, right, right? I didn't right, think right? anything of it. You know, I really didn't. I said, oh, yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll well, I mean, right. and he's asking about <laughs> the injury. I mean, Aaron, Aaron had a mercurial start, mm -hmm. and then the second year, he's 9-4. Right. And, four, mm -hmm. and he's playing really high-level football. He got hurt. Right. Mm -hmm. And they elected to stay with him. And this is, to this day, the two reasons that Saints fans don't like oh, Aaron Brooks, no not, not all Saints fans, yeah, but some no. yeah. don't right. like Aaron Brooks is because, one, they didn't play Jake Delhomme when he was hurt, and Delhomme goes right. on to be a really good NFL right. quarterback. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, did they know that at the time? No. Nope. Two, 
because of Aaron's mannerisms. Mm -hmm. And when we brought Aaron back, when he was inducted into the Saints Hall of Fame, which I caught a lot of grief for from people, it's a media selection committee decision, which you're part of, and it's a private vote. And I voted vote. for him. And it's a private but vote. But I voted for but him. Having and said I vote that, for him again. <laughs> the, point, the point I'm making is mm -hmm. it was not a unanimous decision. No. And mm -hmm. the only time we reveal anything is if it's unanimous, mm -hmm. because this is a private vote amongst skilled professionals who have a clue. And there was a spirited debate. And he gets in, and we heard grief, and even sure. somebody I respect a lot wrote something absolutely ridiculously stupid, mm -hmm. uh, which I called him out on. Uh, and that said, you know, and comparing him to, you know, who's next, Billy Joe Tolliver and things like that, yeah. just absolutely, yeah. you know, just pointless and, and mindless and unprofessional. Look, the guy's mannerisms, and when Aaron was inducted, the point I was going to make is, you, I think you might have been there, what, mm -hmm. the speech he gave was phenomenal. Yeah. This is a man pouring out his heart yeah. and saying, look, I was 22 years old. I was young. I didn't know how to handle this. Uh, it, it really, and it, and it hurt me a lot when people said bad things about me. He said, I was young. I didn't know how to handle it. Right. So I can handle it a lot better now. To this day, I think it's why he washed out in the league mm -hmm. as early as he did. Mm -hmm. Because the guy's physical ability, I mean, he's 6'5". Yeah. Yeah. He could run a 4'6", mm -hmm. 4'7". He could throw the ball through a, through a tire from 40 yards away. I mean, the guy had every skill imaginable. Was he a great quarterback? No. Uh, was he good? Yes. Was he very good? No. Uh, he was a good player right. uh, who had, he did something here who that belongs, hadn't been done before. Who belongs he won the first thing. playoff game yes. in the history of the franchise, and he did it virtually single-handedly. Does anyone remember and have the his wide receiving yeah. core in that game yeah. against the Rams, the defending world champions, the best team in the league? Does anybody remember who his running back was in that game? Oh, everybody was hurt. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Joe Horn was out. Ricky Williams mm -hmm. was out. He's yeah. playing with guys that were B-leaguers guys or D-leaguers if you call the NBA. Mm -hmm. So, look, he was the primary reason. You give him a lot of credit. And I don't overstate the case at all, but, again, he was probably as misunderstood a figure as you've had here. Road Katrina happens, mm -hmm. and then, of course, there's a possibility that the Saints may be moving to Texas. Uh, Arnie Filco comes out. He blows the lid off, off the possible move to Texas. Uh, they end up moving back to New Orleans uh, and, of course, the Dome coming. Mm -hmm. But before that, they found a guy named Sean Payton, and yeah. along with him came a guy named Drew Brees. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, those two names, you know, that says it all, quite frankly. Uh, I wasn't in town when they signed Drew Brees, and I thought, eh, okay, you know, that, that, that's a good signing. Yeah, okay, okay. But I never dreamed that it would turn out this way. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, it's, I mean, he's, you know, surefire first ballot Hall of Famer. You know, wasn't when he arrived here. But he certainly is now. And look where this franchise is now. We're at a point now where, you know, even though we still treat it, we have that fanaticism of the college crowd. Mm -hmm. But, you know, we expect to win now. Yes. Okay. Saints fans expect to win. They want to win. When you're not winning, they want to know what's wrong. And it wasn't always that way. That's a change of mindset mm -hmm. for Saints fans. And, you know, Sean Payton and Drew Brees and crew, the reason why that's happened. And I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. I think it's a good thing. Oh, six, they go to the NFC Championship. Mm -hmm. And that to took Chicago. that. that uh, look, if the city ever needed something, they yeah. needed that more than anything at that right. point. Right. Uh, a lot of us digging Perfect out of. Perfect timing. It was incredible. Digging yeah. out of after Katrina. Uh, people trying to figure out they're coming back to New Orleans. Didn't matter where you were, you were glued to the Saints and, 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 yeah. and they represented us. You know, I, I have always felt, Eric and Kenny, uh, you know, I've never felt that pro football teams lend to the economy what they say it does. Yes. I never thought that. Okay. But this was a case where, you know, I mean, you literally felt that a pro football team really had something to do with the return of the city. No doubt. From Katrina. I mean, I did. Mm -hmm. I, I really did. I felt that way. Mm -hmm. I, did I don't buy the economics of it, but I really do feel right. that way. I Kenny, really do. Your thoughts? Well, first of all, you know, credit to Arnie Filco and credit to Paul Tagliabue because mm -hmm. the Saints wouldn't be here mm -hmm. if it weren't for those gentlemen, mm -hmm. with all due respect, because Tom Benson's done a lot of really good things since he's done everything really well. In fact, I, in my estimation, he's mm -hmm. done things wonderfully mm -hmm. yeah. for the past few years. Mm -hmm. The benevolence is beautiful to see. Agreed. Uh, his wife has clearly steered him in a good mm -hmm. direction in that regard. You can't take it with you mm -hmm. when you leave this earth. And you know, whatever I have, I want my children to have. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I mean, I want to do as many good things as I possibly can, and he's done that. But with what happened uh, to this day, look, I'm a man of faith. I think things happen for a reason. And when the Dolphins make the decision on Drew Brees, they had sound rationale and reasoning to do what they did. 
the Saints took a chance, but then again, what else did they have? Right. So they took the chance, and I don't think in their wildest dreams they could have imagined that it would no. turn out this well. Because yeah. the guy has been a remarkable player, a remarkable citizen. He's done everything the right way. He's the most significant player in the franchise's history. I can say that now. No. Previously, I would have said Ricky Jackson. Ricky. Mm -hmm. and, and Willie Rofe and Morton Anderson would have been right there, yes. mm -hmm. but Ricky would be the most significant guy. But Breeze, because of the position he plays, what he's done, the ultimate winning a Super Bowl and mm -hmm. playing phenomenal mm -hmm. in that game, he's the guy. So uh, credit to what they've been able to do. Now the question is, can they reinvent mm -hmm. themselves? Because they must reinvent themselves. Otherwise, <laughs> this is going to be a, a distant memory. Yes. Well, talk about that Super Bowl win. Talk about that, that year, that 2009 year that was magical here in New Orleans. I never thought I'd see it. Right. <laughs> I, I mean, I really no, did. Me I, I didn't. I didn't think I'd see it. And uh, I'm glad I was around to see it. it it's, you know, it's really kind of hard to describe. You know, I, we all sat around and said, man, can you imagine how it would be if the Saints ever won a Super Bowl? Well, lo and behold, it happens. And, you know, for me, it turned out to be everything that we thought it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just looking and just feeling and, you know, talking to people about it and people talking to you about it. it it's, the vibe was incredible. It, it was incredible. Yeah, yeah. It, it turned out to be everything mm -hmm. I thought it would be. You know, how the feeling would be around here if the Saints ever won the Super mm -hmm. Bowl. It, it, it was incredible. Right. It was incredible. Kenny, what can you add? Well, Again, being born and raised and my dad being an original season ticket holder and he was dying of cancer mm -hmm. at the time and he lived long enough to see them win the Super Bowl. He perished in August of that year in mm -hmm. 2010. Uh, that to me was what it was all about. We still own the tickets to this day. We kept them and he was such a gigantic fan. And so I immediately hearkened back to that. I thought about my sister and being out in the heat of Tulane Stadium for all those years, <laughs> you know, sweating profusely my wife dancing for all those years, myself doing the broadcasts, which I did. And it just all came flashing before me and said, this is, uh, yeah, it's hard to believe that this has happened. Uh, I didn't know what to, to think when, when the interception occurs and Tracy Porter's going the other way. I, I just kind of, yeah. Is I wasn't it, screaming. Is this real? I was right. just like, <laughs> yeah, you know, and my, just blank expression. And I turned yeah. to my son and my son's like, he's getting excited. And he's, and I said, you know, I said, Dad, you win the Super Bowl. I said, yeah, I know. I'm like, I didn't know yeah. what to think or say. <laughs> yeah. It took a while to set in. It's like, I mean, it's the Saints. Yeah. And to see that happen, I mean, look, I don't care if you're in the media. I don't care if you run the Saints Hall of Fame. I don't care if you're a season ticket holder. You're a human being, and you're a fan. And I recall, look, when they won that game in 06 against the Eagles in the Dome, you were sitting right mm -hmm. by me. And yes. I was emotional. And yeah. I know you All were too, work. because you know this is our team. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what industry you're working in. Yes. We're human beings. For for people to say, well, you can't be a fan. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. I'm a fan. Yeah. I want them to win badly. Yeah. Everybody does. Uh, I just have to do a job. Right. Yeah. So you separate the two, mm -hmm. and you give an honest analysis, and try not to make it personal. Right. Mm -hmm. Guys, so many times we've left out. So many mm -hmm. uh, uh, characters left out, like Buddy Delaberto, But we're we're out of time. And Mike Ditka. Mike Dick, uh, yeah, we, 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 right. managed we to skip over that. that. Did, I mean, just so many that we just didn't get yeah. to. But it's been a great ride these last yeah, 50 really years. Oh, hasn't? yeah. Yeah. It, it's, you know, such an integral part right. of the city now. You know, I mean, it's, it's. You can't have New Orleans without Saints. No doubt about it. Well, we've been here it's for all done. 50. The yep. question is, will we all be here for 60? I hope so. Uh, no. Let's all hope so, that's for sure. <laughs> Kenny Trahan, Roe Brown, thanks so much for being on the panel tonight. Thank you. For a look hey, back at 50 years of the New Orleans Saints. It's been a Thank pleasure. Oh, it's been a pleasure having you two guys. Thanks so much for tuning in. Remember, there's a rebroadcast of this program each and every Friday night right here on WLE at 10 p.m., also on Pelican Sports Television at 9 o'clock in the New Orleans, Baton Rouge, and Lafayette markets. You can catch me on the radio, 990 a.m. WGSO, 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. weekdays. You can catch that on the TuneIn Radio app, which is a free download for your smartphone or tablet. Also, you can listen live, download the podcast at ericasher.com as well. Remember, all the previous episodes of Inside New Orleans Sports is also at ericasher.com. I want to thank our guests, Ro Brown and Kenny Trahan, also the WLA production staff, including Ron Yeager, Jim Dotson, Kenny Juno, Donovan Jodos, and also my director, William Hill. New Orleans, thanks so much for watching. We'll catch you right back here next week for another edition of Inside New Orleans Sports.
Inside New Orleans Sports with Eric Asher is the first place award winner of the 2015 New Orleans Press Club's Excellence in Journalism Award for the category of Best TV Sports Show.